invite you to listen as I read Haggai 1, verses 12 through 15 in relation to our message this morning. Haggai chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shutiel, and the high priest, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the entire remnant of all the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him. So the people feared the Lord. Haggai, the Lord's messenger, delivered the Lord's message to the people. I am with you. This is the Lord's declaration. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shatil, governor of Judah, the spirit of the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. They began to work on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month, in the second year of King Darius. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, as we again hear from the prophet Haggai and what it means to hear and to fear you, Lord, help us to be a people that are not satisfied in what we have, our own abilities, but help us seek to be more satisfied with you and what you would have for us how we can seek to serve and to love you more. So, Lord, may we use this time as a time to look to you, but also look at our own lives. Consider our ways and what way you might have for us. In your name that I pray. Words can be a very powerful tool. Often a word at the right moment can save someone's life. When someone yells, stop! There's a danger ahead. Hopefully that person stops and realizes what's about to happen. On the job site, Someone might yell, watch out! Watch out for that! Oh boy. (laughs) It's too late. Words are a very powerful tool. And kids seem to pick up as well as on some of these powerful words. They learn the word no first. No, I don't want to eat my dinner. No, I don't want to brush my teeth. No, I don't want to play nice. No, I don't want to go to bed. Or perhaps they say and learn the powerful word, yes. Yes, I do want a cookie. Yes, I do want a new toy. Yes, I do want to see my grandparents. See, words in the right moment can have power. Even just a few words can be very powerful in a moment. I can recall in middle school and high school, there were two words that would get all of our family out of bed and outside in two or three minutes flat. Regardless if it was 9 p.m. or 1 a.m., they were the words, cows out. (laughs) Meaning that the cows had gotten out of the fence and all of us had to go corral them back in. You know, a few words in a distinct moment have been very powerful. In 1928, Notre Dame was facing the Army at Yankee Stadium. And at halftime, they found themselves behind, and Coach uh, Newt Rockney wanted to encourage his team. So he told them about the death of George Gipp, who was a star halfback who played in 1920. And when Gipp was in the hospital, he asked rookie to have the team win just one game for him. 
And he told the coach, win one for the Gipper someday. Rocky used that story in the game to encourage the Irish to go on to a 12-6 victory against the Black Knights because they won one for the Gipper. On June 12th, 1987, Germany, as you know, had been divided and there was no sign of peace or unity in the country. You might recall the very memorable moment when President Reagan stood before the Brandenburg Gate and he said these words. He said, Behind me stands a wall that encircles the free sector of this city, part of a vast system of barriers that divides the entire continent of Europe. Standing before the Brandenburg Gate, every man is a German, separated from his fellow men. Every man is a Berliner, forced to look upon a scar as long as this gate is closed, as long as the scar of a wall is permitted to stand. It is not the German question alone that remains open, but the question of freedom for all mankind. And shortly after these very powerful few words, Reagan said this, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Memorable and powerful. Other few words in our lives also have a sense of empowering and even a sense of comfort at times. You go to a job interview and you're about to leave and they say, well, we'll let you know. We have to interview another 40 people or so for this position you're interviewing for. So you go away. You're unsure until you get a call. And they said those very sought after words, you're hired. Perhaps you're fed up with your job and you go to your the boss or, or someone there and you say, I quit. Powerful. Empowering words. When you're standing before your soon-to-be spouse in front of your whole family, your relatives, your friends on your wedding day, those two words that you're about to say will change your past and make it different from your future in relation to your spouse. We all know those words. Few but powerful when you go to say, I do. Words can be a very powerful tool. Few words can be empowering in the right moment said by the right person. What are some powerful words in the Christian life? What are some words that no matter where you are, what you're doing, how tired or depressed you are, how happy or blessed you are, that these words can be that of encouragement and even empowerment in your walk with Christ? Now, there's a number of Bible verses that we can turn to, like John 16.33. Jesus says, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In the world you have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We just read a few moments ago, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him who have been called according to His purpose. Now these verses are all good, well and good. And it's healthy for us to have verses memorized as they come to mind as we're feeling down or you know, ready to throw in the towel. But perhaps there's a more powerful word or source that we can access as Christians. Now we've been engaging in the book of Haggai, one of the uh, Old Testament minor prophets for the last two weeks. And you might recall that they are called minor prophets, not because they are inferior to the major prophets of the Bible, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, or Daniel, but in comparison to length. Their works are smaller, even more manageable for us to access today. Not that the major prophets are not relevant, but some of the minor prophets speak to God's people in a short window of time, like we see here in the book of Haggai, which spans all of four months in the life of God's people. And we've been approaching this book and this series from the standpoint of our satisfaction in life. How satisfied are we with our lives? And if we kind of step back for a moment, think about our lives, we might look around and admit that life, we're not always satisfied in every area of life. Perhaps finances, your job, your marriage, your relationships, your church, 
Now we take comfort in the fact that our society breeds this unsatisfaction. And with the influx of big box stores and big companies, they also foster a customer satisfaction, guaranteed, uh, so to speak. You know, Walmart, Amazon, and others are willing to take almost anything back because of their return policies. But if you're to take the same item to a mom and pop shop, you know, they know that if something is special ordered, then they have to transfer shipping costs down to the customer. Uh, they know that they have to charge you a payment for that item because it has to be shipped back to its original location. Perhaps even pay a restocking fee at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, their return policy cannot sound as satisfying as perhaps a big box store. The American dream. But most of the world, as we know, lives a very different set of rules and regulations. Like I mentioned at the start of the series, it was told to me in college that most of the world lives on less than $2 a day. Our nation chases after this satisfaction. Our society breathes for satisfaction. Even our mind, our hearts long for a feeling of satisfaction. God's people in the book of Haggai were even striving for satisfaction, but could not be satisfied. A principle for them and us might be asking ourselves, who are we trying to satisfy? When we open the book of Haggai, we recognize the dates and the datings are very important to Haggai. And I don't mean the type of date that you go on a drive-in and have some hot dogs or popcorn. I mean the type of date that's on your calendar and in the life of God's people. This corresponds to August 29th, 520. And you say, so what? Well, for starters, this is long since the destruction of Israel's first temple, Temple of Solomon, in all of its glory. Since then, because of God's people, their stubbornness and the worship of false gods and rebellion towards God, that He allowed His people to be taken into captivity away from their homeland. And we are told that much of Jerusalem was destroyed and lied in waste. Now some time passes and God's people are allowed to return and they, we pick up in the book of Ezra last week, and we saw the importance of King Cyrus allowing God's people to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the house of God, the temple. And all seemed well and good. The project got off to a good start, and they even completed the foundation of the new temple in Ezra. They were so excited, so overjoyed that they celebrated with a praise service and shouted to God. But we're told in Ezra 3 that not everyone was overjoyed, but some wept loudly because they remembered the first temple of Solomon. The glamour, the glory. But we are told that in light of this, the sound of those who were joyful, in a sense, drowned out the sound of those who were weeping. And the story doesn't end there, but the building of the temple does. Right after this, the neighboring enemies through different tactics, were able to stop the building of the temple and God's people began to be afraid, were afraid to rebuild instead of rebuilding God's house. Some 18 years pass and the people's response to God and we see early on in Haggai is, it's not time yet to rebuild the house of God. Imagine if that was our response when God wants to do something in our lives. God, it's not, it's not time yet. I'm not ready to deal with that. It's not a good time for me right now, Lord. Can you call back later? Now, I'm not ready to give up my pride. Other people out there say, oh, you need to sow your wild oats first. You need to build up your retirement first. Like God's people in verse 4. It's not time yet. We're too busy building our own houses while God's house lies and waste. A neglect of priorities. So they needed a wake-up call. A, they needed a heart check. A rude awakening to realign their heart and actions towards God and their relationship with Him. Over the last few weeks, we have seen how Haggai has used the phrase, consider your ways, as an intuitive question for them to see that God has withheld from them so that they might turn to Him. Even though they're trying to put their lives back together, they're trying to live in the promised land, they have neglected to heed to the one who got them there in the first place. 
Haggai tells them to consider their ways. Or another version says, look at what's happening to you. You plant much, but harvest little. You eat, but you're not satisfied. You drink, but it's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothes, but you can't get warm. You earn wages and put them into a bag with a hole in it. While they're trying so hard, they're still unsatisfied. You might say God is withholding blessings or sancti- uh, satisfaction from them, making them uncomfortable so that they might turn to Him. How many testimonies have we heard from, from people who say that they, they sat in a revival or their friend dragged them to church one Sunday or they watched a Billy Graham uh, a revival on television and they heard about the love of Jesus and how to come to Christ, something inside them burned with a conviction of their sin and their need for repentance. And in that moment, they realized that they didn't give their life to Christ, that they didn't accept Jesus. In that season of life, they would probably regret it for the rest of their life. God goes on to give them plain instruction of how to make things right. Again, he says, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain in verse 8. Bring down lumber. Build my house. Why should they do any of this? It says so that God can take pleasure and be glorified or honored in verse 8. In relation to God's glory, we recall one of the famous lines of John Piper. And that is that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Notice that God's people were seeking to be satisfied in their own lives, their own homes, their own harvest, with the work of their hands. But last week we saw what God is willing to do to his own creation to get the attention of his people. Verse 9 through 11 remind us that God is willing to withhold his creation from producing if it means we turn our attention to him. We expect rain. We expected a lot of rain last night. We also expect our crops to grow. In our day and age, we've formulated so many equations and strategies that we can make things grow to the point that with the right amount of fertilizer, herbicides, and pesticides, we can control how much of a harvest we bring in. Almost. But God's response in verse 9 is, You brought in this harvest. Look at you. I ruined it. I let it go to waste. I blew it away. And this is the key verse, verse 9 of chapter 1. And he says, why did he do this? He says, because my house remains a ruin while each of you is busy with his own house. God brought a drought on his people. They could physically see the effects. They could feel the effects of no food. No produce. The livestock are hungry. Their neighbors are hungry. Their children are hungry. Oh, the land is in such bad shape. We don't pick this up in English, but the word for drought here to the Hebrew ear sounds very very like the word that's used to describe the temple. The drought that they're facing in their own life is a condition of that the temple is facing in ruin. God says, I ruined your harvest by summoning a drought because God's in control of the weather to bring to their attention the ruined state of His house that they have neglected season after season after season. Verse 12, says, verse 12 shows us the right response when God withholds His creation and what is, what is almost na- natural for us is we expect the rain, we expect the crops, but God expects an unnatural response from us, which is to hear and fear Him. You know, we don't want to listen to others, especially not to God. But hearing here is intrinsically tied to obeying. Verse 12, as we saw, lists the leaders. Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, Joshua the high priest, not to be confused with Joshua who took over after Moses. 
And then we read, And all the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord had sent him. And the end of verse 12 says, And the people feared the Lord. Now there's a number of correlations in the Old Testament where the proper response to God's instruction is both to hear as an obey and to fear Him. Deuteronomy 4, uh, verse 1. Now, Israel, listens to, l- listen to the statutes and ordinances I am teaching you to follow, that you may live, enter, and take possession of the land the Lord of your fathers is giving you. And then we read in verse 10, here's where we see the two words come together of Deuteronomy 4. The day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, The Lord said to me, assemble the people before me and I will let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and may instruct their children. Again, Deuteronomy 13, 4, we see these words here and fear. You must follow the Lord your God and fear him. You must keep his commands and listen to his voice. You must worship him and remain faithful to him. 1 Samuel 12, 14. If you fear the Lord, worship and obey Him. If you do not rebel against the Lord's command, then both you and the King who rules over you will follow the Lord your God. But there's also a number of verses in here where the people of God do not fear Him and obey or hear. Judges six ten. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites whose land you live in, but you did not obey me. 1 Samuel 15, 24. Remember King Saul. Saul answered Samuel, I have sinned. I have transgressed the Lord's command and your words because I was afraid of the people. I obeyed them. So there are a number of verses that remind us of God's people's response to God's instruction especially in relation to his covenant, is to hear by obedience and fear him in awe and respect of his power and who he is. So what we have seen is that God's people did consider their ways. Their lives were unsatisfied without him and his blessing on them through his creation. In response to his instruction to go build the temple, they heard God and they obeyed. But it doesn't stop there. There are four empowering empowering words in verse 13. I am convinced no other religion, no other belief system can emulate this relationship between deity and humanity. And that is God's motivation to work for His people. Verse 13, Haggai, the Lord's messenger, delivered the Lord's message to His people. I am with you, declares the Lord. Verse 14, if we were to go on, it says, The Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, And Joshua and all the remnant of the people, and they began to work on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. In other words, in light of verse 12, they heard and that they obeyed and they feared God. But God did not leave them alone and come back when the work was completed. God's people finally realized what the problem was. They recognized that their lives could not continue until they addressed the problem. They knew what the solution to the problem was, to rebuild the temple. And they responded in hearing, obeying, fearing God. But what was lacking? Motivation. They needed to be reminded of the presence of God when He stirred them on to do the work that He was calling them to do. Walter Kaiser in his commentary on this verse says, Isn't it true that when we take one moment one move towards God, He gives us the ability to complete the task. And He gives us this wonderful promise of His presence. He goes on to say that when God is with us, He means that He is right alongside us with His strong presence. In fact, so real is His presence that when He's with us in our service to the Lord, it's not a solo performance, but a team effort. The strong Son of God stands alongside us as we teach, as we sing, serve in His name. And that was the insurance of the returned exiles had. 
This promise that God is with us occurs over a hundred times in Scripture. God does not leave His people alone when He calls them to act. You know, we have many different examples of fathers today. Some say, some fathers will tell their kids, you know, I care for you, but, you know, take care of your mother because I'm leaving and don't ever plan on coming back. Other fathers act as though they're not even there in the home. It's as though dad left the picture. It is not there to help the mom or the kids do anything. Another type of father will tell their son or daughter, I want you to clean the house, fold the laundry, wash the car all before I get back at 6 p.m. And if you don't, you're going to be disciplined. I'm leaving, but we'll be back. And if you don't follow my instruction perfectly, there will be consequences. And yet the last example of a father says, I want you to listen to your mother, help around the house, and care for those around you but I'm going to be with you each and every step of the way. Why did God's people need to be motivated? Why did they need these empowering words of God's presence? Because they had neglected their priorities. They had focused on their own homes while neglecting God's house. It lied in waste. God told them, consider their ways. Or in other words, look what's happening to you. Their lives were falling around all around them. They were unsatisfied. They needed to ask the question, how did we get here in the first place? Second, God told them, consider their ways. What are you supposed to do to get out of this mess? God told them to go to the mountain, bring down wood, build the temple, the house of God. They got them in themselves into this mess. Now God gave them clear instruction on how to back out of the mess. A number of fields that we take hay in this year have a number of wet spots. Perhaps you have some of these wet spots in your lawn, especially after the rain last night. You know you can't drive in these spots most time of the year unless the sun has been out for a number of days. Some of you might say, Pastor, you just described my entire lawn. (laughs) And when you get into a rut, it's kind of tempting to think that you can drive through it. You can drive yourself out of that wet spot in the grass, in the field. But sometimes it's best and you have to call for help to to get you pulled back out of that rut. Out of that mess. You see, God is saying to His people who hear and fear Him, Here's a mess you've got yourself into. Here's how to get out of it. Here's what you should do. And by the way, I am with you every step of the way. God's motivating words, His empowering words for His people, and also for us today. These are not new words. When Abraham's son Isaac was learning to live without his father Abraham and seek to follow God, he got into a quarrel with the herdsmen of Gerar over whose well, who dug this particular well for their livestock. And whether you have a small amount or a large amount of livestock, they need water. They need a source of water. So Isaac men dug another well. They called it the well of hostility because of what they were facing in Genesis 26. And after this, they went to Isaac and his family went to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared to him one night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your offspring because of my servant Abraham. Again, Isaac's son Jacob. In Genesis 28, 15. The Lord says, He says, I am with you and watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to the land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And Jacob woke up from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. God's people needed to be reminded that what sets them apart from the pagan nations whose so-called gods call their people to serve them to the very end, to give everything to please them, 
their God, that God commissions his people and says, if you fear and hear me, that I am with you. These words are not new for God's people. They're not momentary words that God gives them without providing his presence to his people to help accomplish the task before them. God, God's words that empower his people, motivate his people, are the same words for us today, for those who fear and hear him. What are you lacking this morning? For some of you, fall is not your best season. With fall means colder weather, which means winter. Winter means snow and ice and ugh. Don't remind me. We had a heat wave this past week. And you're reminded as the coming of fall comes a change of season. Some of you have started school again as a student or a teacher. And you kind of wish that you, know, you had just one more two or more weeks of summer left. Another week that you could sleep in, stay up late, not have to get back into this daily routine. Whether you're a student or a teacher or on the job or even at home all day, fall brings changes. Sometimes with change lends a feeling of loneliness, even questioning. And we need encouragement. We need a reason to get up and go each day. But for others, you don't have a problem with the motivation to get up and go. You already have that type of mentality. Instead, you need a little direction in your life. You ask yourself, what should I do next with my life? What mountain should I climb next? What place should I travel to? What choices or decisions will I make that will change the rest of my life? You don't need encouragement as much as you need to be emboldened for your life. In both cases, you can resonate with God's people here in Haggai. Some need to be encouraged. Others need to be emboldened with God's word. I am with you. In simple, God is with those who hear and fear him. God's word to his people in the sense of, I am with you. You might translate, I am with y'all, if you have a southern Bible translation. Many people say, I don't need the church. All I need is Jesus. Me and Jesus. And yes, God's message is, I am with you. As he said directly to Isaac, as he said to Jacob. Remember, we are also in context, uh, Isaac and Jacob are in the context of their family, the family of God. And God's presence is with us through the Holy Spirit. Yes, God is with you, but God is with, also with those who come together to worship him, to serve him, and seek to live for him when we hear and fear him. These words come in the context of responding to God. What does God require of us? Is here to seek to live for Him. God is with those who hear and fear Him. These are some of the most empowering words for those seeking to live the Christian life. Perhaps you don't have a relationship with God this morning. Perhaps you're skeptical that the God of the universe would actually seek to be with His people. That Creator God would care for each and every one of His children who are seeking to live for him. Those who are seeking to be the body of Christ work together to praise and serve God in every area of their life. You don't have to take my word for it, but experience it for yourself. When you recognize that the Christian life is not a list of rules and regulations to follow, instead it's a relationship with your creator. The creator of the universe who desires to have a relationship with his creation. Sin brought separation in the world between God and man. God sent His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross so that God once again could be with His people. The Apostle John tells us that Jesus came as the Word and became flesh and He dwelt among us. That's actually the word temple. He templed amongst us. Jesus came to live amongst us so that we can be with God for all eternity. In closing, think of the words of Jesus, the empowering words of Jesus in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go, therefore, Jesus told his disciples, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I commanded you. 
And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, I pray that we can be encouraged and also emboldened by your presence. Lord, it's easy to live the Christian life and see a list of rules, what to do, what not to do. But it's an entirely different thing to see a God who wants to be with his people. Lord, your encouragement to your people when they heard and obeyed and feared you. You motivated them, encouraged them with the very words, I am with you. Lord, is that not your message for your people today? Those who are seeking once again to hear you, those who fear you, respect and in awe of who you are, that you are with your people. Gracious Lord, may that encourage us. May that embolden us to know what you've done for us and to seek to live it in our lives. It's your name that I pray. Amen. Lord bless you. See you next week.